University of Singapore. So I'd like to start this presentation by sharing uh, with you some exciting development in our research program entitled Energy and Environmental Sustainability Solution for Mega City, in brief, E2S2. Basically, so, um, so E2S2 is a program for collaboration between the uh, National University of Singapore and the Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Our mission is to find a sustainable, affordable, and efficient ways to energy system for mega cities. So mega cities such as Singapore and Shanghai face some common problems. For the one you can see on the slides. So in this program, we are interested in solving the couple question between waste treatment and energy. On the Singapore side, currently the research is done in a, a tower building here on the campus of our the NUS uh, Utah. So, so we have uh, started from the phase one, and the, currently we are in phase two for a total of two phases of ten years. So, on this slide, I show you the uh, different kind of waste stream taken from the Singapore statistics. Taking the example of twenty seventeen, in this table, I have sorted different kind of waste stream in a decreasing order of recycling rate. I presume the lower recycling rate means more work to be done in order to be able to complete the circular economy. So in our program, we are particularly interested in the wood, horticultural waste, food, ash, and sludge, together with the plastic waste. So in this talk, I will focus on the challenging associated with non-food organic waste. What is the meaning of non-food organic waste? Here yeah, I give you some example from the left. Farm waste, sludge, horticultural wood. So we use different um, uh, methodology to characterize. Starting from the first stage, in the two phase of our program, we look for use of gasification as the means to convert those waste. Going through gasification, we basically obtain syn gas together uh, with the sum of the solid residue, for instance, biochar. We utilize some of the solar assisted heat pump technology. Then the utilization of such syn gas toward the use in, in phase one, we work in internal combustion engine, CCHP, in combination with dehumidification air conditioning. In phase two, we extend it to fuel, fuel engine CCHP and the variable effect absorption and adsorption chiller. Such results generate in a wide spectrum of power cooling, heat, dehumidification. We then perform scale up to produce pest bedding in industry. To name some examples, we work with a very, in, uh, very famous Singapore tourist spot called Garden by the Bay, where we try to perform the gasification to produce uh, energy together with uh, possible biochar. The applications can be tested also in Singapore local farm. So I'll give you a landscape of what we try to solve for the challenging associated with non-food organic waste. So on this page, I show you some of the specific projects we have in the project. For instance, co gasification based tri-generation with high quality syn gas, new fuel engine and advanced waste heat recovery. So to make a long story short, I take the example of a down drop gasifier, where the waste will be put on the top of the, um, the gas gasifier, then it goes through drying, pyrolysis, combustion, and reduction. The associated chemical reaction can be seen in this table. Then we use the technology towards the, the following type of waste, food, forest, manure, municipal waste, and the sewage sludge to produce syngas and biochar. So this slide shows you the feasibility study. We have successfully used a different composition of the waste as illustrated here. Food biomass, food waste collected from food court, horse manure collected from Singapore Turf Club. Here in Singapore, we do horse racing, right? So every day the horse produce a lot of manures. Chicken manure collected from chicken egg farm. So here we have chicken egg farm producing one, one million eggs every um, day, right? And the sea sludge collected from the wastewater treatment plant. This table show you that we are able to use different combination percentage of the waste in the gasifier and produce syn gas 
which is largely CO and hydrogen. The cumulative volume percentage ranging from 25 to 40 percent, featuring the feasibility of waste to energy concept. The detailed step can be seen over here. So, in a one step gasifier, it has the, the beauty of convenience. However, there are some challenges associated with it because when you use sludge, CV sludge, or when you use food waste, there are some limitations for the mass fraction which you can process it with one step. Because the high iron content in the sludge can potentially trigger some problem of agglomeration and the, indeed kill the reactor. So, so these are some of the technology know-how. So then in terms of the feedstock, one can use different kinds of gasifying agent, for instance, CO2, air, or steam. Here, as a proof of concept, we want to demonstrate that it, it is possible to use CO2 as a feedstock. As, uh, sorry, CO2 as a, a, a feedstock um, um, a gasifying agent. So here we use two different scale of gasifier. The first is a lab, a, a lab scale reactor. The second is a down drop auto thermal gasifier. What is the capacity of this gasifier? It basically runs every hour, can consume 20 kg per hour of the uh, biomass and producing 20 kilowatts of electricity. So is it possible to use CO2 as the co-gasifying agent? So this is has done to evaluate based on different gasifying agents ranging from nitrogen air to CO2. We examine firstly, the cumulative gas volume together with secondly, the cumulative energy output. Please take a look at the data for air and CO2 gasification. We get very comparable energy output. So the answer is yes, it is possible to use CO2 as the gasifying agent. Then we still harvest the energy and it helps to convert CO2 into CO so that we can reduce the CO2 emission. So here show you some of the detailed result in terms of the gas yield at a steady state, right? Which further highlight the promising effect of CO2 gasification. So this slide show you some of the technical performance, including the coal gas efficiency, um, the overall gas yield, carbon conversion efficiency, coal gas efficiency. At the bottom, I'm showing you also the biochar produced. So largely from the energy perspective, there is no compromise when you convert certain fraction of air to become CO2. The gasification can still proceed, right? Furthermore, the, ad the addition of some CO2 actually help to lower the pH of the biochar produced. This has some predictions because in general, for instance, the, the wood waste tend to generate biochar, very alkaline biochar, which is probably not so suitable. So by using CO2 as the gasifying agent, we can um, solve the problem by lowering the pH of a system. So in order to better design the reactor, now let's to take a look at two different scenarios. To the left, we can do kinetic modeling, as I mentioned earlier, there are four zones. For instance, the output of uh, the pyrolysis zone will be the input of combustion zone. So all the four compartments are coupled together. This turned out to be coupled differential equation to be solved from the kinetic point of view. To the right, you can also do three-dimensional computational fluid dynamic simulation, which require to know the detailed geometry within the gasifier, as you can see here. Then we will be able to obtain the corresponding result. Finally, we will be able to compare model versus experiment because by embedding sensor in this gasifier, we will be able to predict the single gas composition and then we can tune the process parameter to match to get the best performance. So viewing this way, taking the CFD simulation, we will be able to deduce the pressure velocity distribution together with the, uh, the gas composition in the gasifier together with temperature profile. Those information, give us the engineering control, how to optimize the performance of the gasifier. However, this approach cannot give us the information regarding the biochar production rate. Hence, by expanding from CFD into a 2D kinetic model in a fixed fat gasifier, we can further elaborate it by considering the reactor to discretize in the actual direction and that the particle domain can be transformed in the, in the domain in the radial direction. So by considering the reactor, taking into account of the suitable nature convection, force convection, and the, the mixed regime, we will 
we will be able to solve zone by zone at the land map the entire process. In this modeling, we are able to produce information regarding the biochar production rate, which is not possible in the previous CFD model. So to realize the comparison, now we should design a very precisely defined experimental condition. Let's take a single biomass pellet, put in a gasifier. So in the online monitoring, we allow to monitor the process through online monitoring of the non-condensable gas by MC, by MS mass. We can also track particular material concentration during, during the, uh, the production of the uh, fine particulate by using aerosol spectrometer. In this way, we will be able to monitor the gas conversion rate. Some other detailed characteristics, including the proxy analysis, include moisture, volatile, its carbon and ash, and atom analysis, controlling all different elements. Using experiment, this will be compared with a hybrid peripheral fragmentation and a shrinking core model. Basically, the qualitative sketch of the model is illustrated at the bottom of the slide. The, the basic, the representative particle model plays an important role in the biomass gasification simulation performance. While the peripheral fragmentation mechanism is introduced to improve the discrepancy of the shrinking core model if you look into at a single particle level, and that the shrinking of particle size is assumed to be proportional to the total volume of particulate material emission, which can be clearly illustrated in the third uh, drawing here. So my colleague, Dr. Xinghe, look into the computer edit design and optimization for biomass generation. He looked into the economic feasibility by increasing the product value and decreasing the op operation cost. He also looked into the sustainability by reducing the greenhouse gas and the particular material emission. By using the biomass gasification model under the steady state, he was able to predict the syn gas generation by referring to mathematical model and the data-driven model. So let me show you a picture of this, the concept of the model. Basically, you can see there are some main platform of the model, including the fixed bed operating conditions, followed by single particle model and a particle fragmentation model. As a result, he was able to predict the emission of the particular material, the production of biochar, and the production of syngas. Then that allowed to compare between experiment and the simulation. My colleague, Dr. Chang Hu, his primary interest in, in a slightly different problem. He's interested in chemical looping gasification of biomass with calcium modified iron oxide oxygen carrier under steam agent. The conceptual development is actually shown on this diagram. So gasification through chemical looping technology is an efficient way to convert waste into hydrogen enriched syngas. Here, we use two low cost material, iron oxide, and calcium oxide as the looping material for gasification. When the ratio of calcium uh, of iron to calcium is one to one, the resulted calcium variety uh, resulted in the highest hydrogen production due to the direct reduction of Ca2, Fe2O5 to metallic iron. And uh, the carbon conversion was promoted with more calcium due to the catalytic volatile cracking. The hydrogen can be produced through three pathways. Firstly, by char steam gasification reaction. Secondly, by water gas ship reaction and the reforming. And thirdly, the water splitting by, by the metallic ion. Furthermore, the comparison of chemical looping performance by using mechanically mixed calcium oxide and the iron oxide and the chemically synthesized Ca2, Fe2O5 was studied. So result found out that the mechanically mixed calcium oxide and the iron oxide can achieve autothermal chemical looping gasification process, which save energy. Chemically synthesized Ca2, Fe2O5 can achieve chemical looping gasification coupled with water CO2 splitting to produce pure hydrogen or carbon, carbon monoxide.
So my colleague, Li Xian, he has interest in solar and biomass by source nexus for highly efficient conversion of waste to energy. Okay. Um, so he looked into a clipboard type internal circulating through the spec solar reactor, focusing on the multi-phase flow model to validate some experimental results. The experiment actually was conducted under the Singapore's first 28 kilowatt solar simulator. And in the study, he looked into the effect of gas flow rate and the bed mass on the corresponding thermal performance. He also looked into the solar to thermal conversion efficiency of silicon carbon, alumina, and the sand particles. Some of the example will be um, featured in the next slide. Okay, um, so far, different solar gasifiers have been developed and their performance on gasification have been investigated. Through this bed reactor have been widely used in gasification applications due to the following merits, namely continuous operation and high heat and mass transport. In this work, a novel high temperature through this bed solar reactor with internally circulating configuration is designed, constructed, and investigated using the solar simulator mentioned earlier. The internal circ circulation of the fruit ice bed solar reactor is capable of mitigating overheated absorber surface caused by hot spots and homogenizing the bed temperature. The objective of the work is to study the heat transfer and two-phase hydrodynamics inside the developed solar reactor, effect of various particle material and gas velocity on the thermal performance are uh, uh, tested by experiment. To study the effect of gas flow rate on argon and the thermal performance of a developed ICFB solar reactor, the operating parameters such as bed mass um, uh, is basically kept constant. The combination of experiment and the simulation shows effect of bed mass and the gas flow rate on thermal performance can be revealed. The major finding of this work can be summarized as the following. Increasing the gas flow rate or superficial gas velocity can significantly enhance the particle circulation between the low velocity and the high velocity regimes. Consequently, the temperature difference among wall and the bed can be significantly reduced. However, the optimal circulation rate is dependent upon the particle density, shape, and the gas flow rate. On this slide, the left-hand side figure shows you the particle circulation rate at the various gas flow rate and the three particle material. For sand particle, the high flow rate led to undue bed expansion associated with the low solid fraction in the gap between the clipboard and the gas distributor. For silicon carbon and aluminum, although the high flow rate also reduced the solid fraction, a trade-off between the particle velocity increase the high flow rate also reduce the solid fraction. So in this work, the highest um, conversion efficiency of 10.7 is found for silicon carbon particle and 9.5 for the quartz sands. So this is um, obtained from the low flow rate regimes. In contrast, in the high flow rate regime, the corresponding efficiency is about 10.2. So that can be reached by the following experiment. A joint PhD student, Jia Ling Chen, is interested in studying the Stirling engine based gasification CCHV system. She actually applied the system to study the conversion of food waste. In this study, the optimum equivalence ratio was determined based on the coal gas efficiency. She looked into the levitized total cost and primary energy saving ratio to optimize the system in which the monthly energetic, economic, and environmental analysis was conducted. Charing also performed sensitivity analysis for the efficiency, cost, and CO2 emission as part of this process. Another joint PhD student, Tan Chu, looked into an industry collaboration project 
DCHE based dehumidification air conditioning. So this is a collaboration with Merson Private Limited. So we perform in the Singapore's Garden by the Bay. So the title of the project is the gasification based cogeneration of heat and cooling by using the solid waste. So in this collaboration, we aim to extract the waste heat from the max gasification system for use by our desiccant dehumidification air conditioning system. And the aim is to upgrade the value of energy product and to investigate the overall performance of the integrated system. We also evaluate the feasibility of scaling up and the, the desiccant dehumidification air conditioning system for other applications. The work by Dr. Kena Zhao, where it's basic, basically um, to develop a mathematical model for multi-agent waste to resource network optimization. An example application is on a chicken menu waste to resource in Singapore. As I mentioned earlier for a chicken egg farm producing 1 million eggs, how to handle the chicken menu would be a question. In this network, there are more than 30 agents playing the roles of waste producer, buyer, treatment service provider, using, for example, co-gasification. Co the objective of the model is to form the optimal waste transactions between the agents to maximize the recovery of variable resource, hence promoting a vibrant circular economy in industry. Biochar, which is produced as a byproduct from pyrolysis of gasification of waste biomass has been found to have great significance in alleviating environmental issues, especially climate change. In Singapore, water hyacinths can be found in the surface of a pond as a free floating aquatic plant. This demonstrates the ability to remediate pond water contamination. Combining sequential thermal chemical conversion Cultivated water hyacinth biomass can be used to produce biochar, which can be further used in Singapore industry and the constructions. We also look into the life cycle assessment coming together with this process. So in the system, we are also interested in handling uh, conversion to resource. For instance, our project look into toxicity assessment and reutilization of ash and the other solid residue from anaerobic digestion gasification incineration process, and a product developed for land reclamation and construction material. The work by Dr. Arun Kumar is on um, the conversion of hazardous coal fry ash and wood fry ash to variable geopolymer using a green method. The two material of concern include fry ash and the button ash. Some of the characteristics can be found in this table. Now let's take a look at the recycling rate for Singapore. It's about 10%. And uh, currently, this ash go to landfill in an island called St. Macau Island. Unfortunately, this island will be full by year 2035. Because Singapore is short of land, our best strategy would be not to landfill it, but to use it for some useful material. Hence, this study looked into the physical, chemical, and thermal treatment method to convert those ash into construction material, road-based material, a wastewater treatment, and the land reclamation so that we can get more land. An extended problem on environmental toxicity. My colleague, Dr. Ambu Mozi, look into the environmental toxicity effect of raw series large button ash coming from incineration. So this comes from the wastewater treatment plant. She look into the ash leachate and to test it against human skin and the lung cell. From here to obtain information regarding the associated toxicity to set the potential guideline regarding the use of this kind of ash. My colleague, Fang Hua Li, is interested in the next generation biofuel. She is interested in doing a technical evaluation of biodiesel from waste cooking oil. This process, which is known as the trans estratification reaction, follows the protocol mentioned here with the uh, invention by Dr. Li on using algal balloon, chicken manure, and the water hazardous. All three are waste under the carcination condition to generate an interesting nanoparticle catalyst. This catalyst can convert the waste cooking oil into biodiesel, right? And some of the performance indicator can be seen over here. For instance, the chicken manure nano catalyst can demonstrate highest biodiesel yield about 
And uh, this nano catalyst could be reused for up to three times with the 3% loading. Another work by Dr. Ding Ding Yao is on the conversion of waste plastic. The waste plastic going through pyrolysis and the catalytic reforming under the presence of a special design nano catalyst. She was able to produce hydrogen and the carbon nano tube. So clearly, waste plastic present cheaper and abundant carbon and hydrogen source. Chemical recycling technology can indeed offer a promising alternative to convert waste plastic into hydrogen and a valuable carbon material. So the novelty of the study actually comes in the newly designed iron nickel catalyst to achieve the goal. The work by Dr. Ming Hang Tai is on the turning the leached carbon black waste into solvent for removal of oil and organic contaminant from water, PVA, leached carbon black waste aerogel. Dr. Tai's invention comes in the form of the following steps. So the performance of this uh, waste material is quite interesting. So he was able to use the MTCS coated aerogel to increase the hydrophobicity. He was able to use this material to promote hydrophobicity to super hydrophobicity to have a counter angle greater than 150 degrees, which is very impressive. Out of the story, the bio waste goes through thermal process to generate biochar. It has advantage than burning carbon into CO2, which can cause CO2 emission. So we do gasification, retain the carbon in the biochar. Then we use biochar for a variety of applications. This can help to mitigate CO2 emission. In this regard, from industry and government perspective, we would like to set up a standard in Singapore to regulate the sales and the production of biochar. So giving the example of Garden by the Bay project mentioned earlier, where they use the locally produced horticultural waste to generate biochar. Such biochar is then tested in the, in the garden to test whether it can grow vegetable. So it close, produces a closed loop, right? So that is a, a modular concept for both energy and the material. So the derived question is whether all the plant generated in this way will be able to satisfy the Singapore Fertilizer Act regarding the heavy metal contents. In this way, we need to look into the possible published standard by European Biochar uh, Certificate, IBS standard, and the Korea Fertilizer to come, come up with the potential Singapore's version on this. At the same time, the biochar can be used for construction material. Biochar can be used as a constitute for cementitious construction material, especially as a sustainable alternative to cement, sand, or other energy intensive admixture used for concrete manufacturing. One can use biochar in concrete as an effective means of carbon sequestration. And this again, come into the problem whether the heavy metal content set, satisfy with other benchmark countries around the world, particularly the European countries. Biochar can be used as, as aggregated carbon. This involves a few reactions as indicated over here, involving pyrolysis, uh, mixing and aggregation. The typical unit operation can be seen over here. Finally, the price of the Aggregated carbon depends on the surface area. So the target is about 800 meters square per gram. Then such product will be benchmarked commercially with the well-accepted industrial performance indicator to fit with their price. Biochar can be used for anaerobic digestion. In our study here, using together with the food waste anaerobic digestion, biochar can enhance the bioenergy production and improve the biofertilizer nutrition Taking the example of methane production from anaerobic digestion can have increase of 37% in the yield and 24% in the composition. The concentration of MPK can have significant enhancement to facilitate use in agriculture. So let me put everything I said together. So in this biochar standard, we aim to look for the Singapore version, how to make use of this carbon waste, right? And uh, uh, then, we want to define a minimum requirement for the physical, chemical, biological, and labeling aspect of a biochar. This provides a good guideline between the government agency, university, researcher, and the industry to come up with a button up approach to set a standard so that we can realize the circular economy. Finally, I would like to comment on some work 
on the urban urban metabolism analysis as a pathway to assess the overall environmental sustainability of waste utilization strategy. In this scope, we assess the sustainability in the current way. Singapore and Shanghai utilize our food and non-food organic waste, which can be improved by analyzing and enhancing the ways material and energy are used for waste recycling. So this page highlights some of the facts for Singapore and Shanghai. Ur urban metabolism is an important tool for measuring resource within a city and uh, analyzing possibility for circular economy where material are reused, re upcycled, and recycled rather than relying on external sources. So the statistics of the two cities give us the best data to perform the following extended exergy accounting model applied to evaluate the performance of the municipal solid waste management system. Taking the overall urban metabolism sustainability index, a joint PhD student, Chen Rui Liu, was able to use this to account for the development of Singapore and Shanghai through the E2S2 program. So finally, I would like to close this presentation by um, showing contributions from the different um, collaborators in, in this E2S2 project. They are largely faculty members from Shanghai Jiao Tong University and the International University of Singapore. And also the contribution by industry collaborator. Finally, I would like to take up the chance to thank the funding agency, the National Research Foundation Singapore for supporting the project. Thanks very much for your kind attention. I would be happy to answer any question. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Wong. Um, very interesting lecture, huge amount of development work. So, Zeni, can you read the questions, please? Um, there is a question from Doug Moriat. What is the thermal efficiency range for various feedstock? Okay. Uh, clearly, the uh, different kind of process will be associated with different energy efficiency, right? So let me take the example of the data I have shown here for solar. Solar classification, which is considered to be the um, not so well studied up to now, right? I think the well-known uh, research group, including ETH at Australian National University uh, for, the, um, for the similar topic. The energy efficiency, as I have demonstrated earlier on, based on the work of Dr. Shen Li, so, so let me cite the energy efficiency. It's roughly around 12%, right? So this is currently what we can have with the laboratory scale testing we can do, right? Okay, thank you. Any other questions, Sunny? No, that is... Okay, fine. Thank you very much, Professor. I really appreciate your, your talk. Excellent, thank you.